Time now, however, for the Vinyl Cafe Story Exchange. Well, you know how this works. This is the part of the show where you send us your stories. They have to be true stories, and they have to be short stories, but after that, well, after that, they don't have to be anything at all. After that, it's up to you. We'll read everything you send us, and we'll read some of our favorites here on the radio. And if we choose to read your story on the radio, well, we'll send you a copy of our latest book, Vinyl Cafe Notebooks. We have a story today from Michael Gallagher, who lives in Hope, Maine. Dear Stuart, writes Michael, in movies and television, whenever someone meets a married couple, it seems the question, how did he propose, comes up. At least that's how it seems to me. But in 15 years, not one person has ever asked me how I popped the question. Being a good and somewhat typical American, despite not being asked, I'm going to tell the story anyway. Because <laughs> I think it's a good one. In September of 1996, my girlfriend Kim and I had just graduated from college. We'd both studied biology, and we were both setting out a plan for graduate study. We had the world at our feet. Our grand plans came to an abrupt and unpleasant halt, however, when Kim was diagnosed with leukemia. Don't think I need to elaborate on what a diagnosis like that can do to a 22-year-old who thinks she's just beginning her life as an adult. Kim immediately began receiving treatments, treatments which at time felt more dangerous than the disease itself. For the next six months, Kim spent over half of her time in the hospital stuck on the cancer floor. Kim very rarely complained about her condition or her circumstances. She was the doctor's and nurse's favorite and most heartbreaking patient. I spent that six months driving to the hospital, sitting by her bed, watching television with her, pacing the halls with her, and worrying about her. Whether it was denial or stubbornness or pig-headedness, I'll never know, but I had a deep belief that she would be all right. Unfortunately, that belief was not shared by her physicians or by the disease itself. After three aggressive rounds of chemotherapy, the leukemia kept coming back. The treatment was not working. Kim needed a bone marrow transplant, but a donor had not been found. Time was running out. After the disease came back for the fourth time, Kim was hospitalized for more chemotherapy. Her father caught me on my way into the hospital one day and took me to a waiting room. Looking exhausted and defeated, he shared some dire news. Kim's physician didn't believe she had survived this fourth round of chemotherapy. She needed the transplant now. He suggested we all prepare for the worst. I sat back against the chair, stunned. My deep belief that Kim would be fine did not jive with this news. I looked at Kim's father and repeated that time-worn phrase that many men have uttered before me. Sir, I said, I would like to ask for your daughter's hand in marriage. Kim's father, being the big, strong, macho man that he is, immediately began to cry. I'm not sure what he was thinking, but I can only assume he felt some relief that his daughter would at least get to have a bit of happiness amidst all of the gloom. The next morning, my mother took me to the jeweler where she and my father had purchased their wedding rings. My mother, the jeweler, and the jeweler's wife spent hours with me finding just the right one. That afternoon, I drove the hour-long drive to the hospital, practicing the perfect speech. When I entered Kim's room, my heart fell. She was sitting by the window, crying. This was not something she did. When I asked her what was wrong, she said that the case manager had just left and the case manager had shared the opinion of the medical staff with her. The end was near. I went over to my jacket and pulled the small box from my pocket. 
I walked back to the chair that she was sitting in and knelt down beside her and gave her the little box. I took off the surgical mask I was wearing that was meant to protect her from me and my germs. I looked deeply into her eyes and said, I believe in you. So much for my practiced oratory. Upon opening the box, Kim began crying all over again. But this time, just like her father, the tears were mingled with smiles and laughter. For the first time in what felt like ages, we kissed. The nursing staff found out what had happened within about a nanosecond. <laughs> Joy, which was not a common emotion on that floor, spread through the unit. I'd like to be able to tell you that everything worked out okay, that a donor for Kim was found, that she got her transplant, that she got better, that we married and went to graduate school, bought a house and started a family. So I will, because that's exactly what happened. When looking back at that time in our lives, some folks like to say that Kim's survival and recovery was due to divine intervention, a result of some unimaginable number of prayers said and whispered on her behalf. I mean no disrespect to anyone, divine or otherwise, but I politely disagree. I believe the turning point had more to do with that modest, pretty ring than anything else not because of me or what I did or didn't do, but because of what that little ring represented, hope. The story came to us from Michael Gallagher. Michael and Kim live in Hope, Maine. Thank you.